on a mission to save lives, a mother encourages members of France's African diaspora to donate bone marrow so that children like ours might have a better chance to live. Meet the vanguards of the campaign against female genital mutilation. Trained by the United Nations, they work with traditional religious and market leaders on the need to stop the practice. Hello everyone, many thanks for tuning into the show that brings you continent-wide stories. I'm Train Balinuso at Channels Television here in Lagos. I'm joined by Vincent Macquarie from Voice of America in Washington. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent Macquarie at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Our broadcast still looks a little different because of the global pandemic, but we truly appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain Uso in Lagos brings you that story. Now more than 100 girls have been trained by the United Nations Population Fund to become vanguards of the campaign against female genital mutilation in Oyo State, Southwest Nigeria. The girls, chosen from local government areas where the practice of genital mutilation is prevalent, are learning to interface with traditional religious and market leaders in their communities on the need to stop female genital mutilation. The UNFPA is targeting a drastic reduction of prevalence in Oyo State from 61% to zero. 108 students drawn from nine local government areas of Oyo State, 15 teachers as mentees and 30 volunteers at the 2021 Adolescent Boot Camp organized by the United Nations Population Fund in pledge of allegiance to promoting equality and giving voice to the silent traumatic challenges of the girl child. More precise efforts are being targeted at the reduction and total eradication of female genital mutilation in Nigeria, with adolescent girls changing the narrative. I am a girl. I am a girl. I'll dream of another girl. I'll dream of another girl. To be an advocate. This boot camp was created to accelerate efforts aimed at the abandonment of female genital mutilation and other harmful traditional practices across Oyo State, which has been said to have one of the highest prevalence in Nigeria. According to the UNFPA, this initiative has been tested and proven effective in the bid to reduce and eliminate FGM. Nigerian NDHS data actually shows that Oyo State is one of the states that has high prevalence of FGM. To also provide them with skills, advocacy skills, to be able to reach out to their traditional leaders, religious leaders, and convince them about living this age-long practice and that they have autonomy and power to their body and that their bodies should not be subjected and neither to that of their peers. For participants, excitement at this opportunity to become ambassadors for a worthy cause depicts their eagerness to help their peers. I believe that this is a great platform for them to learn a whole lot of things that would build them and shape them for a better future because I was once in the shoe and I made use of the opportunity to become a better me. FGM is a very great crime in our society. It is not good at all because it makes a lot of damages to the female child. Though they think that they are using it to help us, but it is coming in, in a negative way. These girls are expected to return to their communities and speed up awareness on the need to discontinue the harmful practice of female genital mutilation and encourage the girl child to blossom. Joining us now is Dr. Shekumade Bayo, who is a former president of the Association of Resident Doctors, Luth. He's also a gynecologist. Thank you for joining us on Africa 54. Thank you, Chamberlain. Could you speak to the consequences and the need to eradicate female genital mutilation in Nigeria? Uh, female genital mutilation is defined by the World Health Organization as the all procedures that involve the partial or total removal of female external um, genitals. 
And it's a practice that is that has no known medical benefits. It is influenced by culture. It has um, it is a practice that is widespread in globally and especially in Nigeria. Nigeria accounts for about all the about third of all the cases of women who have experienced FGM globally. And um, in um, coming down to absolute figures, about 20 million women are estimated to have experienced this procedure. It has a wide range of um, short and long term physical health and mental complications in women. It can cause severe pain, bleeding, and the bleeding can be excessive sometimes and, and can lead to death. It's also known to be associated with infection and some of these because of the um, settings in which some of these procedures are done, the infections are not properly treated sometimes, and they can later on lead to short or long-term consequences in those women. For some of the women, the pain never, never really goes away. They have to live with chronic pain throughout their lives. So there's a need for us to address some of the suffering that our women are exposed to as a result of SGM. Um, particularly because it has no known medical um, benefits to the women. Again, we found out that an underpinning attitude to the um, sustenance of this practice is the gender and is rooted in gender inequality and patriarchy. It's actually um, it's, um, um, there's a need for, for, um, for, for the society to take ownership. There's an attempt rather for the um, society to continue to manipulate and take ownership of the um, bodies of women. I find that these are some of the issues that continue to uh, lead to the perpetration of this practice. And because this thing borders on the um, human rights, infringement of human rights, we have a duty as, um, as a people to ensure that we protect fundamental human rights of women to have access to um, adequate health care and the and the protection of their dignity. So that is why um, any activity, any policy, any principle that is geared towards the eradication of FGM is welcome. Right, so um, clearly a need for a multidimensional approach to solving this. But how much impact do you think this training of girls by the United Nations will have towards eradicating this practice? Well, it's not a problem that's going to um, way away in one day, and like you said, we all lands need um, all all lands need to be on deck. We need to pull a lot of people into it. Uh, but um, training of girls is a necessary first step in the sense that they are the um, the um, victims, if I may use that word, are actually young girls, well, sometimes infants. Whereas the people perpetrating, the people involved, the people who are responsible for carrying out the procedures are older women. So there's a need, and um, for, for some of the um, narrative that we have heard, some of the girls are not even aware that they are going for, um, that such a procedure was going to be carried out on them. Because it is rooted in um, cultural practices, they sometimes they feel, oh, it's a thing of um, joy because it's actually seen an, as an initiation into womanhood. So they are totally oblivious of some of the um, procedures and the ramifications. All right, uh, Dr. Shekuma Bayo, thank you. You're welcome. In Senegal, overfishing has led to an environmental crisis that is having an oversized impact on small fishermen. Alison Lekogo Fernandez and Mbai Ndir report for VOA from the Senegalese capital, Dakar. It is 2 p.m. on your beach in Dakar. Time for fishing boat Captain Adam Afal and his crew to return to dry land after 10 hours at sea. Their catch this day is disappointing, mostly small fish. That's been the case for months. It has become very difficult. Sometimes we have to travel up to 100 kilometers to find fish. Fishing occupies a prominent place in Senegal's economy, contributing 3.2% of the national GDP. More than 600,000 people, roughly 17% of the population, are engaged in fishing, processing and the wholesale trade. 
seafood is a key part of the Senegalese diet. But most of the fish caught in Senegalese waters now are taken by industrial trawlers. The catch ends up as fish meal used to feed industrial livestock. That leaves fewer fish to feed the Senegalese and a dangerous shortage of fish in general. The decline of fish stocks, especially the pelagic species that live in open water such as sardines and the larger fish that eat them, worries the head of West Africa's artisanal fisheries association, Musambeng. Avant on connaissait. Before, there was a scarcity of the main coastal damarso species, which were so-called European species, which were exported. Back then, the coastal pelagics were doing quite well. But today, the situation has worsened with the overexploitation of the main coastal pelagic species. To preserve the fishing industry, the government has frozen fishing licenses. But enforcing the restrictions has been difficult. We still have difficulty enforcing the regulations because there are always some people who cheat. They always have an alibi. It's more difficult to find fish we have to eat. But we are obliged to enforce the law despite the difficulties. The UN says 90% of the world's fisheries are fished out and face collapse. Senegal is an example of the world's problem. And it's a problem with no easy solutions. Alison Legogo Fernandez for VOA News, Dakar. A young Nigerian entrepreneur, Adekunle Daniel, has developed a Bitcoin ATM that will enable Bitcoin investors engage in financial transactions securely. The BTM, which is similar to a traditional automated teller machine, is easy to operate, works in a bi-directional way as it allows users buy and sell Bitcoin directly via the internet. When one visits a traditional automated teller machine, also known as ATM, it's expected that one inserts a debit card to withdraw or deposit cash. But at this Bitcoin ATM, you can only buy or sell Bitcoin using cash. Adekule Daniel, a young entrepreneur with knowledge in blockchain technology development, has designed and developed a Bitcoin ATM, the first in Nigeria. So essentially, I was trying to solve um, a major problem, which is um, turning physical money to a digital money, because Bitcoin cryptocurrencies are digital assets. So I was looking for a way to bring that digital asset closer to the people in real time. Bitcoin machines work in similar fashion as the traditional ATMs as they allow users to engage in financial transactions. However, they are yet different in that they are not connected to a bank account. Instead, they are linked to a Bitcoin exchange via the internet, which allows users to buy and sell Bitcoin directly and instantly. I did few research, you know, uh, developed, got, got into a few components, and then um, trained software to recognize Naira, fake Naira, and a whole lot. It took me a few years to do that. So I want to buy digital assets. So. The BTM works simply. All one needs to do is verify yourself by inputting your mobile phone number into the machine, after which a verification code by text is received to be entered into the machine. Once logged into the BTM, one can decide to buy or sell. To buy, you insert cash into the machine, a QR code is generated from your crypto wallet on your phone, which is scanned to receive the Bitcoin. And to sell, you can send Bitcoin from your digital wallet to the QR code by the ATM. The Bitcoin ATM is connected to the internet and it comprises of a monitor, QR scanner, bill acceptor, and dispenser, all tied together via software to make Bitcoin transactions convenient and secure. To visit our website, channelcv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channels web. Still to come, a beauty contest where men are judged by an all female jury. This pageant in Nigeria rates gentlemen on their makeup, dancing, and fashion.
Welcome back to Africa 54, Vincent McCory in Washington. A French woman of African origin is leading a campaign to encourage more members of France's African diaspora to register as bone marrow donors to potentially save lives. Elhami Lecour filed this report for VOA from Paris, narrated by Michael Lepin. Corinne Tonnier is a mother who lost her 13-year-old son, Ulysse, to a rare blood disease nine years ago. His only hope for a cure was a bone marrow transplant. But with so few members of France's African diaspora registering as donors, no compatible match was found. So Tonnier created an organization in Ulysse's memory and organized this football match in a Paris suburb in September to raise awareness of France's need for more ethnic African donors. For Tonnier, the need is urgent. I have a second son who also has a rare blood disease that will require a bone marrow transplant. For now, he's trying to hold on. Unfortunately today, there is no suitable donor in the registry for him. The French government's biomedicine agency says African origin donors are underrepresented not only in the French registry, but in all global registries. Only two African countries have bone marrow donor registries accredited by the World Marrow Donor Association, Nigeria and South Africa. Experts say it is especially hard for black patients to find compatible donors of African origin because Africans have a greater genetic diversity than other groups like Caucasians. Françoise Oda, a French doctor specializing in blood disorders, is helping Tonnier to highlight these issues. We try to register African donors all over the world, but the proportion of Africans in some countries is not very high, so it takes a lot of volunteers to find a compatible donor. One could imagine having registries in Africa with more donors to provide bone marrow to compatriots in diaspora communities around the world. But the problem is political instability, which makes communication difficult. Without more African donors, a patient such as Tonye's son Thomas has only a small chance of finding a match. The French biomedicine agency says the likelihood of any individual patient being compatible with a bone marrow donor chosen randomly from the world's registries is just one in one million. For Elam Lecoeur in Paris, Michael Lippin, VOA News. Let's head to Niger to watch a beauty pageant with a twist a traditional beauty contest in the West African country where women judge the male contestants. Makeup, great dancing skills and intricate outfits are a few things the young men of Wadabis must have in their arsenal if they want to attract the interest of the all-female jury. You should have a look. Their faces painted with yellow, red and white clay, 22-year-old BG and his friends put the finishing touches to their outfits using beads and other accessories on their intricate outfits. <laughs> Preparing for a traditional beauty contest known as Gerewol, it's men who dress up and compete while women pick the winner. This age-old traditional festival is held every year in Niger by Wadabi men and an all-female jury. The contestants dance for hours for the women, whose criteria, amongst others, is to judge the men's suitability as lovers or husbands. This year, Beiji is optimistic about his chances. This time, I think I am going to win because my friends here are old. Their time has passed, whereas I am very young and I am handsome. To attract the attention of the jury, the men must also be tall and slender and have facial symmetry and good teeth. The women chose the men because only a woman can recognize the most handsome, the most slender, the one with the beautiful eyes for marriage. It's us women that choose our husband. 
Each member of the jury chooses her favorite contestant and can take him as her lover, even if both are already married. The participants perform the Yaki ritual dance meant to showcase their best attributes and their elegance. They roll their eyes, they show their teeth and sing, hoping to be noticed by the jury members. This year, Beiji finished in fifth place, but was still chosen by a member of the jury to spend some time and get to know each other. The festival marks the end of the rainy season and the start of the dry season transhumans migration for the nomadic Kodabe who keep herds of zebu cattle with long horns. The ocean data that scientists need to understand climate change, marine life and plant uh, plate tectonics can be expensive and risky to gather. Matt Dibble looks at a company that uses seafaring drones in place of research ships. This new vessel plying the waters of San Francisco Bay has no crew on board and is powered only by the wind and sun. It's being prepared for an important mission. The oceans cover over 70% of the world's surface, but they're really virtually unexplored. Less than 7% of the deep, deep ocean has been mapped. And that's what the Southern Surveyor is really designed to do. What it gives us is a three-dimensional, beautifully detailed picture of every topographical feature down there. Sail Drone also has a fleet of smaller autonomous vessels that have successfully sailed the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and circumnavigated Antarctica. They are packed with sensors to collect data related to weather, climate science, and marine life. Sail Drone sells the data to government, scientific, and commercial organizations. It's really important to measure the oceans and to understand exactly what's going on so we can help not only predict the future, but possibly help change the future. Surveyor also has sensors, but its main mission is to map the deep ocean floor using sonar. Traditionally, research or mapping has been done by ships, very large ships like you see behind me, with a crew of 40 to 50 people on board, burning thousands of liters of diesel fuel per day. By harnessing the wind power, we can survey for months on end without coming back to port. I mean, it really removes the risk of putting humans in remote, dangerous places. The vessels are given a destination, but work out the details of navigation themselves using onboard artificial intelligence. For a thing to survive in the open ocean for 12 months by itself and set itself back really is a very, very tough challenge. Sail drone vessels are proving they can survive these missions and collect data vital to understanding our watery planet. Matt Dibble for VOA News, Alameda, California. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channels Television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, ChannelsTV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chamberlain Assault. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.